Hello there, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. An inquest hears from relatives that a trainee at West Yorkshire Police took his own life because of bullying and discrimination. The force says it doesn't accept the claims made by relatives of Anugra Abraham. We'll have the latest. Also tonight, police searches continue a week on from the disappearance of a mother in North Yorkshire. Victoria Taylor's family say they are distraught. The new way of treating cancer is being trialled in Leeds. It's been called an advance from a Star Wars era. And happy birthday, Park Run, as it celebrates its 20th birthday. Thousands of people take part. You've been sending us your pictures on the run. And for most of us, this is what our weather has been like out there today. But how is it looking for the rest of the week? Join me at the end of the programme for all the details. Hello, you're joining us for the first look north of the week. I hope you're well. An inquest has heard that a trainee police officer in West Yorkshire suffered bullying and racism before his death. 21-year-old Anugra Abraham from Bury died in March last year. His family say he took his own life because of the treatment he received while on placement at Halifax Police Station. These claims are not accepted by West Yorkshire Police. Katie Barnfield reports. 21-year-old Anugra, known as Anu to his family and friends, took his own life in March last year. He'd been working as a trainee police officer for West Yorkshire Police based in Halifax. His parents told the inquest into his death today that he'd wanted to work in the forces since he was a child and that getting into the police was a dream come true. His mum told Rochdale Coroner's Court, when he was collecting his uniform, we were all so proud. He was so happy and we were so happy for him. That was his dream and he got his his dream. But his dad Amol told the inquest today that in the months before his death, Anu had been struggling at work. He told them he was being bullied, including by his sergeant, and that there was a racist culture there. He said, I asked him why he was not enjoying it. He said, Dad, no one is supporting me, especially my managers, my supervisors. There is no support and I can't do it on my own. His dad became emotional as he recalled the last days before Anugra died. Through tears, he said, We loved him so much. We loved him greatly. He was everybody's favourite. But in the last days before he took his own life, he said to us, I can't take it. There's no support from anywhere. We were thinking we, would, we were sending him to the best place where he would be supported. He said that before Anu died, he was having nightmares about work and about his sergeant, Mark Wade, that was so bad he had to sleep in his bed to comfort him. The coroner asked him why this wasn't mentioned when he took Anu to a doctor's appointment on the 2nd of March, two days before he was found dead. His dad said, because Anu was calm on that day, I was concerned about him, but I kept thinking he is in a very safe place. The inquest continues. Katie Barnfield, BBC Look North in Rochdale. Next tonight, police and community searches are continuing a week on from the disappearance of a mother in North Yorkshire. Victoria Taylor, who has a, a two-year-old daughter, was last seen in Moulton bus station. Some of her possessions were found near the River Derwent. Corinne Wheatley has spent the day in Moulton. She joins us now. Corinne, this is so sad. What's the latest? Well, as you say, Amy, yes, their searches have been continuing in and around Moulton for Victoria Taylor, the 34-year-old who hasn't been seen now uh, since last Monday. North Yorkshire police say that she left her home at 9am that Monday and that she was seen again on CCTV around two and a half hours later at the BP garage. Now, following an update from North Yorkshire police this afternoon, we now know that the last known sighting of her is on CCTV at Moulton bus station at 11.53 last Monday. Uh, now, police have been uh, trawling through CCTV footage and speaking to witnesses, and images of Victoria can be seen in lots of places around this area. There are posters up in uh, shop windows, in businesses, and tied to lampposts, reminding passers-by that she is still missing. We know that she has a young child at home, she has a partner, and she has friends and family all anxiously waiting for news of her. I'm sure they are. And tell us about that search operation. What's going on, Corinne? 
Uh, yes, well, the searches are still uh, seem to be focused, the physical searches still seem to be focused on the River Derwent. Now, where we are now, we're quite close to the town centre, but quite a lot of the police activity today has been a few miles downstream. We know that some of her possessions were found near to the river last Tuesday. Um, police showed us some of the sonar equipment that they've been using to search the river this afternoon. The arm of the sonar equipment dips below um, the level of the water, and we watched this boat as it slowly moved up and down the River Derwent as they carefully searched. Uh, now, we did get an update from North Yorkshire Police today. They're saying they're keeping an open mind about this investi investigation. They say at the moment there's nothing to suggest any third party involvement following her disappearance and that they're still treating this as a missing persons case. Uh, now, we know volunteers have been doing their own searches along stretches of Riverbank as well. North Yorkshire Police have said they understand why people want to do that why they want to help but they're urging people to be really careful near the river if they're going to search themselves. Karen, thank you. Next tonight it's been called a medical advance from a Star Wars era. A cancer patient who only discovered she had a kidney tumour after a car crash is being treated using a new sonic beam therapy. Leon Pemberton was referred to Leeds Cancer Centre for the trial after being diagnosed in January. Now the treatment uses highly focused ultrasound waves. The health secretary has called it an example of world leading technology in the NHS. Our health correspondent Jamie Coulson can explain. Hello, is it Ms. Leon Pemberton, is yes. that correct? Yeah. Leon Pemberton has a small cancer in her right kidney. The tumour was only detected when the 54-year-old was scanned following a car crash in January. Now she's about to undergo a new non-invasive treatment being trialled in Leeds that harnesses the power of sound waves to destroy tumours. I feel blessed and honoured, really. Blessed that it was found in the accident and honoured to be taking part in such a trial. The procedure involves a new sonic beam therapy called histotripsy, which destroys tumours at a cellular level without the need for an incision or needles. Highly focused ultrasound waves are directed into the target area where they produce rapid pressure changes in tissue. These cause naturally occurring gas microbubbles to expand and collapse rapidly. This forms a bubble cloud, which causes targeted cells to mechanically break apart, while surrounding structures are spared. So basically we're dropping the treatment head. It's a painstaking process to precisely position the patient and plot a detailed treatment plan before the automated procedure is activated. So we localise the tumour and you can see the tumour is within the, the margins of, of the um, treatment planning and we are going to go ahead and treat. I have always said we are entering a Star Wars era. Having this treatment available for our patients in the UK population could be totally transformative. Now this procedure typically takes about four hours from start to finish but once the actual treatment begins, in this case it'll take about 35 minutes and because it's non-invasive the patient recovery time is much shorter. So the treatment is life-changing, but this is a treatment that is lifeless, and then there's no radiations, and it's non-thermal, and it could provide greater access for patient, uh, cancer patients to have this therapy. Leon was able to go home after one night in hospital. Initial scans are still being reviewed, but the team believe the tumour has been largely treated. Happy. <laughs> Happy to say I'm ringing round the place telling them how I feel, the procedure. I'd give them thanks, I'd give them praise, I'd say yes. This trial continues until the end of December. Jamie Coulson, BBC Look North. Positive response so far, that's great. People in our region have been reflecting one year on from the October the 7th attacks on Israel. Hundreds of people attended a rally in Leeds yesterday, organised by Leeds Leeds Against Antisemitism. A minute's silence was held for the 1,200 people killed in the Hamas-led attacks and the dozens of hostages killed or still been held in Gaza. Nobody can, can forget what happened a year ago and we as a community have got to stand up. We've got to remember that the, the hostages that are still there. We've got to remember those that were murdered, that were abused. Um, that, were, that were in a way that was done that no one's ever seen before. 
Meanwhile, people gathered in City Square in Bradford this lunchtime in support of Palestine. Since the October the 7th attack on Israel, more than 41,000 Palestinians have been killed in the Gaza Strip, most of them civilians, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. I think if you look at what's happening in the Middle East now, what's happening in Lebanon, and there is a serious um, concern there's going to be a, a massive escalation of this war, where we have been calling for peace for over a year and for it to end, it only seems to be getting worse and worse, you know. Um, violence perpetuates violence at the end and, you know, we just want everyone to stop killing each other. Now, sites around former coal-fired power stations in Yorkshire are being repurposed as the UK moves away from burning fossil fuels to generate electricity. Today, the largest battery storage plant in the country went live at Drax in North Yorkshire. Excess electricity can be captured and then power thousands of homes when it's in high demand. Here's our business correspondent Spencer Stokes to explain how it all works. It might not look very big against the backdrop of Drax power station, but this is the country's largest battery energy storage system. Cooling towers for the wood chip fueled plant, dwarfing the 54 battery units at Lakeside Battery Park. Energised last week, it can store 100 megawatts of electricity from the grid, enough to power 30,000 homes for a day. Batteries play a vital role in storing electricity when there is an abundance of supply and distributing it later when there's peaks in energy demand. Essentially, we can get more cheap, reliable green energy on the network, keep power prices down and kind of accelerate towards that net zero target. Traditional energy sources like coal and gas are being decommissioned as part of the drive towards cleaner power. Unit 4, shutting down. That was reinforced last week with the closure of the UK's last coal-fired power station at Ratcliffe in Nottinghamshire. It means more energy from renewables will be required. But to exploit the full potential of the sun and wind, electricity needs to be stored. Today is a good example of how these big industrial batteries work. It's quite breezy, so wind turbines, both onshore and out at sea are producing lots of electricity. But demand is comparatively low. So instead of that energy going to waste, it's being soaked up by the batteries, ready to be released later today or later in the week when demand peaks. It's not just industrial sites that are being used for batteries. Harmony Energy wants to build a 100 megawatt system in a field next to Heath Village near Wakefield. So they'd all be down here, would they? That's right, yeah. The, uh, the public footpath we're on now, uh, to, to the bottom of it. Residents have been fighting the scheme for two years, and it's still not known when there'll be a planning decision. It's a populated area, as you can see. We've got housing, uh, and uh, brand new housing estate at that. We've got a traveller site over there, and we've got a heritage village to the, to the left of the uh, proposed site. We're not against uh, battery energy security in this country, but it's got to be in the appropriate places. This is not an appropriate place. Harmony Energy say the location has been chosen to keep costs low because of proximity to the nearby substation. This is currently the largest battery plant in the country, but not for long. A 150 megawatt system is expected to open at the old Ferry Bridge power station site later this year. Spencer Stokes, BBC Look North, Drax. Time for sport now with Mark and let's hear it from the girls. Yes, indeed, football to come. But first, let's start with rugby league and an historic night for York Valkyrie, who became the first team to retain the Women's Super League. The game is growing and the more that we can push it out, you know, and get small younger girls and boys to play the sport, they, you know, they will love it. And it's not too late to join if, you know, you're 15, 16, 20 years older. Yeah, it's it's really growing and hopefully we can push it, not just uh, nationwide, but throughout the world. The evenings are drawing in. Are you looking for a good autumn drama to get stuck into? Well, The Hardacres, which starts tonight, follows the lives of a working class family in the 1890s. They move from a grimy fish dock on the Yorkshire coast to a vast country estate. It's from the creators of hit series All Creatures and stars Claire Cooper from Wakefield. We're going to hear from Claire in a moment, but first, here's a taster. For you, my lady. Who needs diamonds, eh? 
Um, are we going to keep a roof over our head? We'll find us work. What if we went into something for ourselves? All we know is herring. Exactly. This is just the start. This is our home now. Welcome to Hardy Girl Hall. We'd be lovely to get to know one another. Your accent. I can't quite place it. It's Yorkshire, love. You live in it. Oh, looks right up my street. Claire, I am so excited that you're here. Finally, I get to go on your couch. I know. For those who don't know, probably many of our viewers don't know, but Claire and I are good friends from school, so to finally see you in a part like this is just wonderful, because growing up, you talked about wanting to be in period dramas, and here you are, a leading lady. Here I am, playing Mary Hardacre. She looks a fierce woman. Oh, she is. Amy, she's brilliant. I mean, you know, I love these spicy women. You know I like to play these strong, strong women. But Mary's, she's really, really interesting because she is a force of nature, but she's an optimist and a, and a woman of that time didn't have the same opportunities as men, you know, they were really limited. So to see this type of woman come to life on screen, it's really, really exciting and great to play, obviously. So it's filmed in Ireland. Mm. How Yorkshire is it? This, guys, this is a really Yorkshire show. This is, this is really through and through Yorkshire. Um, in fact, everyone kept you know, coming back to me saying, is this how you say it? Is this how you say it? Is that how you pronounce it in Yorkshire? Well, you are a native. <laughs> yes, I'm a native, yeah. <laughs> so it's optioned for five series, isn't it? So this is hopefully just the start of well, yeah, a really long journey. It depends if people watch it and they enjoy it. Fingers crossed, this is a really, really gorgeous autumn show for you to sit back, kick back, have a cup of tea and enjoy with a family. It's, it's lovely. You've been acting for a long time. Yeah. You're married to Emmett, mm -hmm. who is also an actor, Emmett Scanlon. You've got a lovely young family, but your big break has come in your 40s when you are juggling so many things. How, how do you do all that? I am juggling so much. I don't think I'm any different from any other working mom. You know, it, it is a, a challenge and it's a conflict. It is, of course. You know, I've got two little ones running around. I'm trying to learn lines. In fact, I have to always work at night when I have work to do, which I do at the moment as well. But it's a juggle, but I have a supportive husband who is also very, very busy. And we just we just figure it, just like everybody does, we just get by, you know. It's having the headspace as well, isn't it, to yeah. retain lines and information while you're, you know, up in the night trying to feed and, and do all the baby juggling as well. But you know, kids, they bring you a different perspective. The way you tackle things, it's just so different. The way I tackle something, you know, 10 years ago is so different now. You know, I'm Claire, a lot more at ease. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. It's brilliant. It's on tonight, Channel 5, 9pm. Yeah. We can't wait to see it. Thank you for having me. Ah, you know, we always said growing up, one day when I'm a presenter and you're an actress, I'll interview you on telly. It finally happened after 30 years. Well done, Claire. Now, we finally finished tonight with Part Run. This week, weekend, thousands of people celebrated the 20-year anniversary. How? Well, they got up really early to run 5K around a green space, of course. The weekly run at Fountain's Abbey near Ripon has been named as the best in the country because it's stunning scenery, obviously, isn't it? Our reporter Heidi Tomlinson and camera operator, operator put my teeth back in, Emma Shales, put on their joggers to find out more. It's been described as the most scenic park run and on a sunny autumn morning, it's easy to see why. It's stunning. It's really beautiful. You come down a bit of mist over the valley. It's lovely. I moved to Ripon just over a year ago and what a fantastic environment and I just thought I have got to do this. We've been on holiday in the Lake District for a week so on our way back down south to Hertfordshire so we thought we'd stop off at Fountains Abbey because it's known to be a really pretty one. Three, two, one, go! Around 450 people gather at Fountains Abbey near Ripon every Saturday to run 5K. Parkrun was established here 10 years ago, but the movement is now celebrating its 20th anniversary. I love it. It's just such a great way to start the weekend. I'll say by 10 o'clock, you could say your exercise is done for the weekend and you could feel quite virtuous about it. It takes 30 volunteers to stage this event. They log entrance, keep track of time, and most importantly, provide encouragement. Great running, everybody. Marshal Lenny Lennox marks the route and gets the course to himself first thing. We're very fortunate to be allowed to use Fountains Abbey as a, as a venue. I mean, it's a, the most beautiful venue in the country. There's the fast runners who don't see anything apart from what's in front of them. And then you've got the, the other runners who come to, to look at the venue and stop and take photos. So in my mind, the whole point of exercising in amongst such stunning scenery is that it distracts you from how hard running is. It's really not as difficult when you're absorbing a world heritage site. 
Participants appreciate the spectacular views free of charge for an hour thanks to a collaboration between Parkrun and the National Trust. This is part of Yorkshire's identity. When we see the images of fountains, you know, it, it's really close to people's hearts. Fiona from Kent is a Fountains Abbey first-timer. Suddenly, it blows your mind. It's all worth it then. Oh, yes, even if you weren't here, it'd be worth it. <laughs> Every time. Go on, Every carry on. Works. Carry on, doing well. Thank you. So, a bit of behind the scenes. Massive respect to Emma, our camera operator, who's running with that really heavy camera so we can keep up with everybody. Well done, Emma. Park Run is centred around respect and inclusivity. There are no age or ability limits. Finish line cross, but with this course in particular, it's tempting to take a cool down lap to properly absorb those mesmerising views. Heidi Tomlinson, BBC Look North, Fountains Abbey. Well done, ladies. Emma's the only one who'd agree to do it. Let's see some of your park run pictures, shall we? Here they are. Happy 20th birthday, Park Run. Weather was glorious for it as well this weekend. Emmanuelle is here for her Hello. first 6.30. Hello. Welcome to the team, Emmanuelle. Thank you very much. I'm sure your forecast is more accurate than Paul's, so take it away. <laughs> well, I'm not saying anything about that. Uh, good evening. The first thing I wanted to show you, though, are some absolutely beautiful weather watch pictures that we've received um, around the region today. This was um, in Scarborough. A bit of cloud, but I think in other parts of the region, we have seen something a little bit brighter with a good deal of sunshine. Look at this absolutely beautiful so what has it been like where you are well, I would absolutely love to hear from you you can always send me your pictures on social media and even better you can actually sign up to become a weather watcher so what is the weather looking like for us here tomorrow well we are expecting a mixed picture really we are expecting um, a few scattered showers those showers could be quite heavy potentially thundery in places but we will also have some sunny spells at times too so what's going on out there well we do have this area of low pressure off out to the west that's what's brought us some of the rain today and then tonight turning increasingly unsettled because we do have um, a trough and also um, some fronts moving up from the south and that's what will bring us some heavy rain so then this is how it's been out there today. We've seen a fair amount of cloud, but also some sunny spells in a lot of places. But as mentioned, turning increasingly unsettled as we head through tonight. It will start to cloud over eventually, and that's ahead of a band of heavy rain moving up from the south. That rain could be heavy and potentially thundery as well, with temperatures no lower than 9 or 10 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow we will start off with some rain in places, but before then, let's just take a quick look at the high water times. You can see there in Scarborough, uh, just before eight o'clock and also in Whitby, uh, just uh, after half past seven in the morning. So then we'll start off with some rain. It will eventually clear off and then it's really a day of cloudy conditions. We'll also see a few scattered showers, as mentioned. They'll be heavy, potentially thundery, but in between there will be a good deal of sunny spells too. Temperatures, though, potentially getting up to highs of around 16, 17 degrees Celsius, just above average for the time of the year. So then as we head into tomorrow night, we're expecting some further showers. They will stick around. It will be quite cloudy, but the winds will be light as well. And then I think a lot of that rain will clear by the time we start off on Wednesday. Back to you. Great job, Manuel. Welcome to the team. Nice Thank you very much. That is it from us. Mark Ansell is here with the late news from all of us here. Bye-bye for now.